So we're here today for episode two of the Turf Cast. I think that's what we're going to call it. And Ryan is joining me again today. I wanted to thank everyone first off on the last episode for so many great comments and some encouragement there too for us that they wanted they wanted us to come back and do some more. So we said, hey, we can sit and talk about turf. Let's do it again. So Ryan, thanks again for joining today. And I think we're going to have some fun talking about renovation and preparing. And then a few questions too we'll touch on from the last episode. But thanks for joining me again. Super excited to be here, Ryan. So do you want to get right into some questions here just uh, from the last episode quickly? Yeah, yeah, that was a that was a pretty deep dive. I don't think anybody was expecting to get a notification from Ryan Nor uh, Lawn Care and have a fifty whatever two minute video uh, sitting there in their inbox. So uh, hopefully they di they digested well. Um, yeah, but I'm anxious to hear what their questions are. I'm pretty sure Lushy said that he watched it twice so far, so he's he's all in. But you know him. There will be no test or quiz after this. I promise, Lushy. Yeah. So, you know, don't feel like you have to cram. Okay, so one of the first ones that I thought, and I wish we could get to all of the questions, but there's sure. just so many on there. We'll, we'll try to get to stuff. Uh, we'll try to write back on YouTube if, if we can. But Absolutely. Um, this one is, I'm wondering what the cutoff is for high humidity. This was mentioned quite a bit, but no numbers were given. Anything over 60%. Uh, so I responded back and just said, I'm personally looking more at dew points a lot of the time, and over 70 is starting to get pretty tropical. So... Yeah, I agree. I think a dew point is probably a, a more um, layman's term, and, and even for a pro, it's, it's it's a better measure to look at because it's looking at um, more than just relative humidity in the air. It's actually how much moisture you can actually feel in the air, more so than just humidity. So um, in that regard, I mean, 70 is sort of the cutoff between like, you know, you go from I'd say 60 to 65 dew point and you're still, you know, pretty comfortable for the most part. You're definitely feeling it. 65 to 70, it's definitely humid and past 70, it's tropical, you know. So um, I know we were just chatting a little bit here before the stream and I told you um, coming out this morning at my house here in uh, central Ohio, uh, like 74, I think, was our dew point this morning. It's felt like a nice spring morning in Bangkok. <laughs> uh, you know, so I, I, that's, that's the time where you can just hear the turf, like saying, please give me some wind, please give me, you know, something to dry us out because that's, that's just the danger zone right there. Um, you know, so, um, more so than that, you know, that's when, that's a time to, if we, you know, as our, we talked about and alluded to in the, the last show, um, backing down on the watering at that time, for sure. Like we do not need to water. Um, so but I did see the, the the old HOA down the street had their sprinklers running just like they do every morning at 8 a.m. By gosh, you know. Yep, they not going to stop that, that. That's right. you got to get that 20 minutes in no matter what. So it's yep. like their cardio. So. <laughs> so I think, that, yeah, that's usually what I'm looking at too. And our soil holds quite a bit of moisture at those, you know, when it's that humid sitting there, especially because we have a very, not extremely heavy, but it, it's much heavier than, you know, a sandy soil or something. So. Absolutely. So next question, we briefly talked about this too before our stream, but this one is from someone that lives in Gilbert, Arizona and said, my Bermuda is struggling because average temps are 108 during the day and high 80s to low 90s overnight. The humidity is never over 10%. I'm watering 4.30 a.m., 8.30 a.m., and then sometimes later at 6 p.m. Should I syringe during the middle of the day? Oh boy, that one is... Yeah, I mean, when you live in a blow dryer, uh, you know, that, no, and, and so here's the thing, you know, we talked about, you know, heat stress and physiological responses to that. Um, if, if there's ample water in the soil, um, the syringing part, especially in that situation where you're, you're very, very, very high temps, very, very low humidity, um, you get to that point of diminishing returns very, very quickly, um, to where what you put out there is is literally being evaporated before it can do any good and cool the plant. So, you know, in that regard, I think you're seeing more so uh, physiological stress from the heat where uh, chlorophyll is starting to break down. Some of we talked about like those interior um, proteins that are inside the plant that have specific um, jobs to do inside of it are starting to unfold. And so, you know, some of the things you can do there um, for heat stress like that is just, it's not so much even heat. It's just the sunlight and the, the, the energy that's being beaten down on the plant. 
Um, I, I don't think syringing is going to help that. Those are going to be some other inputs and just also riding it out. So. Yeah, yeah. And that, I don't know your opinion maybe on this too, but maybe in that scenario too, specifically looking at wetting agents or something like that to help at least try to hold any moisture there at all. I don't know, but... Yeah, I mean, just real quick on the wetting agents would be, um, you know, the the ones that are marketed as hydrating, you know, that, that hold water. Really what those do, they don't make, you know, water wet or anything like that. You know, there's, some, there's some physical interaction in the soil, but the biggest thing that they help with is they regulate and even out the dry down so that your dry spots aren't turning on a dime and, and, and drying out relative to you know, some of your more average moisture areas that maybe take, you know, a day or two longer. So it's kind of making yeah. everything a little bit more even and you can catch it in time before it uh, gets to yeah. that wilting point. I really can't imagine though, being at 90 degrees overnight. Let's just, ugh. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, people can, can say what they want about the Midwest and snow and it's two degrees in the winter and everything like that, but give me four seasons like any day of the week and I'll be just fine. I can, yep. I can manage through that, so. Yep. The last comment here wasn't really a question, but it was just one that I thought was pretty funny. So it said, is there a way, and I know they're talking to me, is there a way for you to get a better hat? And I just simply responded with no. No. Well, I mean, <laughs> I'll just say it. Go Browns. Uh, and, th and thank you. Thank you for Kevin Stefanski. We'll see if, uh, I think, I can't remember if he's the 19th coach or what, whatever number he is. We've, we've had a lot, um, you know, here as Browns fans. And so uh, more coaches than wins in the last uh, several years so hey good luck with him that's all i have to say but now i know how things go with the vikings is that whenever someone leaves they obviously excel and when they were with the vikings they were terrible so i look forward to this that's how that's how it works no hopefully we get a chance to watch i'd be excited for that so yeah well, let's kick it off here. What are we talking about today? Renovation, right? We're, we're talking about renovation. We're getting to that time of year here where I'm actually preparing to help my neighbor do some renovation. So I thought it would be a great time to sit, chat about that a little bit. And I, I know that it's quickly coming before, uh, before we know it here. So uh, we're talking about renovating cool season grass. And so that obviously involves the seeding for the most part. You know, you can talk about sod too here and there, but... I think a lot of people, when we're talking about renovation, probably go towards the seed just because it's a little bit, usually it's a little bit uh, kind of easier to do that part, except, you know, maybe new construction, we can talk about sod sometime too, but. Yeah, I mean, there, if, if you're just going to go on the seed versus sod debate, I mean, you look at seed cost, just pure seed, not fertilizer, all the other stuff, um, you know, it's, it's about... Um, somewhere to between 20 and 30 times more expensive, you know? So when you get into that, and that's, you know, if you if you have a contractor dude or something like that, there's ways to shave money off of each of those figures, but uh, by and large, it's it's exorbitantly more expensive to sod. And um, yeah, it's probably a topic for another time, but as far as prep work and everything like we're gonna talk about here goes, that's all the same. You know, mm -hmm. how we choose to establish we can talk about sod another day, but for sure that that's something to, to consider. Well, and I think that a lot of people think that sod is an easier route that you just throw it down and then it's like, oh, I have a new lawn. But there's a lot of work involved there to get that to survive and to thrive and all that too. So don't think it's just some throw it down easy fix that you never touch again either. Yeah, and, and you're, you're kind of hamstrung on what kind of selection you might have as far as cultivar. So if that's really important to you, um, you're probably going to have to, um, you know, uh, allow for, you know, maybe not what you want to be out mm -hmm. there. Um, and so that's another thing too. But yeah, sod, sod is an interesting topic and we definitely can talk about that here uh, going mm -hmm. forward. So I think that's definitely an episode in itself for sure, probably. <laughs> yeah. But Let's talk about one thing that I think are the basics in terms of a full renovation versus overseeding an existing lawn. Kind of what are the differences between those two? Yeah, so for, you know, I think generally accepted uh, terms for those two things. So renovation, um, you know, we look at that as a complete overhaul. So we're going, you know, removing and or um, spraying out or, or killing all the existing vegetation that's there and basically starting over. And so there might be some extra steps involved to whether it be remediate soil uh, after soil testing, you know, with fertilizers, things like that. 
um, correcting grade issues that we might have that might allow for better drainage. Um, maybe if you've also got some other yard projects to do, you're putting in a patio or you're doing a hardscape and you're trying to time all this stuff up. Um, those are considerations to make there too. So with overseeding, you know, we're taking an existing stand of turf and trying to um, sow or plant um, improved cultivars into that system. So, you know, that takes on kind of a life of its own where you know, we first need to assess, okay, if we're not going to remove everything here, what is actually here that we have to work with? That's the first step. And then in our preparations, what way might we enhance um, or take away from in our preparation? So, um, you know, if we've got a, a modeled look of, you know, all sorts of different grasses out there, that might be an opportunity where we say, okay, hey, if we have um, a bunch of fescue um, over here, you know, in this part of the yard, and then we come over here and we've got this nice, brilliant uh, bluegrass, and then it's mixed in with some perennial ryegrass that I threw down in that little tree that didn't survive from Lowe's the three different times I planted it and got a warranty on it. <laughs> yep. We've all, I've got a neighbor down the street that's planted the same spot, the same tree, like uh, three times, and I just feel bad and tell him it's, it's probably time to move it. You know, we need to... Mm -hmm. We need to think of something different here. But in, in any event, um, you know, you look at those considerations of why would I want to overseed my existing um, versus a renovation? And so let's just take it kind of from the best case scenario down to the worst. So if you've recently done a, a, a renovation, like say in the last two or three or four years, um, probably a pretty good bet if you did a good job in that, you can get away with overseeding. And, may, you know, you might not even have to do that at all. I would consider uh, an overseeding to be necessary if we were, say, um, somewhere around 30% of turf loss throughout the summer. You know, so if we're only at 70% coverage, um, in you know, average throughout the lawn, that might be an opportunity definitely to look at you know putting in some improved cultivars and introducing some more seed to that system. There's a really cool app you can go on. Um, I know it's on Android. I don't know for sure if it's on uh, the App Store for Apple. But uh, Canopeo, C-A-N-O-P-E-O, -E it's a really cool app that uh, was developed at Oklahoma State. You basically stand over your turf at waist level, you snap a photo, and it'll tell you exactly how much percent cover you have. So if you do that over a few spots of the lawn, it, it, it makes it a little bit more quantifiable than just the old, uh, it looks <laughs> like it could be 50%, I don't know. Yeah. So, And it gives you good ammunition if you have to go to your... Uh, your um, decision makers within the home to be able to say, well, look, you know, right here, it's, you know, we're, we're below 70%. We got to do it. You know, um, can't argue with data, right? That's right. That's unless, right. Uh, unless you've been, unless you're married. So then, then it becomes a little bit more challenging, but, um, in any event, so we go from that scenario where we've got, you know, an overseas situation on, um, you know, a, a recently renovated lawn down to, okay, this, this lawn, maybe we newly purchased this home, um, we've got an older stand of grass that, again, could have multiple different types of grass, different looks, different textures, as far as, you know, you may have like a real stocky old rye grass that leaves a lot of uh, those seed stalks after it seeds out, or real clumpy um, fescue. Um, maybe even on the, uh, all right next to a nice looking bluegrass, and that just doesn't have that look in that, again, that texture of how it feels, how coarse or fine it might be in the leaf blade, all those sorts of things. And so in that situation, you really got to ask yourself, okay, uh, I'm probably going to have to pump in quite a bit of seed and I can only do so much at a time. You know, this is going to be a multi-year process and I'm still going to have to accept that what's here isn't changing and what I plant into it is probably going to take quite a while to take it over. Yeah, and I think, too, what I have found with that sort of scenario was I tried going down that route for two to three years with my front yard back when it was when I first moved in, and it was looking better, but also survival of the fittest, that old grass, it is pretty impressive how you can beat it up, you can do whatever, and you think, oh, I've got it all thinned out, I got a bunch of good seed in there, and then the next year you're like, how did this come back so well? There's all this stuff there. Yeah, and, and that's the thing, is like the stuff that's been around, you know, whether your home was built in the, you know, the 40s or 50s all the way up to the 80s, you know, that stuff, generally speaking, it might not always look good, but it is a prize fighter. It, it will get to the eight count, stand up, and punch you in the face mm -hmm. when you least expect it. So, and usually when you don't want it to happen either, you know, so 
you're thinking, you know, you're sitting there all spring, um, you know, after you, I'm sure that you did this, you know, you sat there all spring, you're like, hey, you know what, it doesn't look too bad. I could live with this. You know, you see some of your new seed coming up and everything like that. And then, uh, and this is invariably what happens is you get to this time, you know, July and the last six weeks, you just kind of sat there and waited for the other shoe to drop. Your new grass is starting to look good, but it's still splotchy and how it fills in. And then, you know, the old, the old girl just decides, you know what? It's July, you know, whatever, 20, whatever. I'm done. I'm yep. done, and I'll see you later this fall when it cools back off. And you're just like, man, I really wish I would have just killed that all out and just yep. started over. So yep. that gets us to a renovation, you know. And so that's where it's we are ripping off the Band-Aid. We're, you know, we're, we're uh, removing that grass or killing it off um, in one way, shape, or form and starting over. And so uh, that also gives us the opportunity to do some other things, you know, as far as uh, correcting grade issues, um, and some other stuff that you'd probably want to look at at that time too, if you're going to be that involved. And I understand too, that a lot of times it's either a time thing or a money thing or whatever, but, um, these are the types of things that if you do them right and plan them out right. And I know again, like we talked about before, you're a planner, you're, you're a guy that likes to have every I dotted and T crossed and that pays such dividends, um, when you're doing this, uh, to make sure that, all the other things besides just the grass seed. I mean, that's just the icing on top of the cake, right? Yeah. You want to make sure that that cake tastes good and that it's not just, you know, some yeah. good icing and some Betty Crocker out there. I think definitely that's the part probably where people get frustrated the most. Maybe is because they didn't plan any of that out. And then on a weekend, they decide, yeah, I want to redo my yard or, <clears throat> or I want to overseed or I want to do whatever. Well, you're not going to have that kind of success without some planning, some prep work, and then having all your ducks in a row for what happens afterwards and, and all of that stuff too. But um, yeah, I was thinking too, when we were just talking about that, <clears throat> excuse me, that was whoever inherits my yard when I move is going to be like, I've got mono stands going here. I've got ryegrass lawn in the front. I've got a bluegrass mix in the side. I'm going to like, it's crazy. So yeah, I mean, and <laughs> It's it's crazy, but even at the pro level, you see that too, where, um, you know, folks walk into, you know, even, you know, the best golf courses or sports fields or whatever, and it's, you know, anymore, it's a, um, I wouldn't say a race, but it, it's definitely like this predetermined path of, okay, well, what does the new guy want and how do we get it to be the way that, you know, he or she uh, would want it to be, you know, as far as grass types and selection. So, this is a thing that, you know, everybody sort of has their preference on how they get there, you know. So I think that's the one thing, too, that, you know, in talking about all this stuff and, and just trying to bring it back um, to the fundamental question is, what are your expectations and how do you want to manage what you're going to do? Because you could put in, you know, the most expensive, awesome bluegrass or whatever it might be, but if you don't understand how it needs to be taken care of and you don't have the, you know, the money or the time to support that type of program, then it's, it, you know, all that effort's just wasted, all that time, all that money, everything. So, um, you know, kind of going and, and shaping those expectations. If you're fine with that, um, you know, that funky looking fescue and that stocky ryegrass and everything being in there mixed in with some other stuff, that's fine. There's nobody telling you that you're wrong. So, um, but if you want to have a hundred percent, you know, monistan bluegrass lawn, like, that's an investment of time. That's an investment yep. of money and it's never going away, you know, unless you decide to move and, you know. Yep. Uh, so, so I think a lot of the question that I see from people uh, also comes in with weeds and, you know, they inherit some yard that has not been taken care of for 15 years and they see nothing but what appears to the eye of nothing but weeds or something in that scenario. So what would you say in a scenario like that should they be looking at to see whether or not they could keep what's there or they should, you know, decide to renovate? How would they make a decision there? So again, I'd, I'd go on, you know, coverage of what you have and what's desirable. So uh, that's another key point there is just because I have 70% coverage of, of grass and not just grass and weeds together, how much of that grass is desirable, um, that I'd want to have. And so, um, the way I would look at that is, um, 
what do I have time to control? Especially if it's right now, if this is a latent issue, like we're going to do it here in August or September, then you better be thinking about this really quickly because um, controlling weeds, doing some of the necessary work to get ready for all that stuff versus just spraying out is, you know, that the, the uh, former is a much longer process than the latter. And so, um, you know, I, I find I find it, it's again reshaping those expectations. If you're if you're looking for um, a healthy dark green, lush lawn, um, and doing it quickly, then spraying out and doing a renovation is going to be your your fastest and, and truthfully least expensive option in getting there. Um, I think the danger is, you know, if we're talking about cost and time and the investment of those things is. Let's say that you go down the road that you went down, right? So that you decide, hey, I'm going to I'm gonna tame this beast. I'm going to control all the weeds, and I'm going to make the grass that's there happy, and I'm going to give it some new friends with some new grass, and everybody's just going to, everything's going to be awesome. And you go down that road for three years, and then you're just like, you know what? This sucks. I got to... <laughs> I got to pull the bandit off and it's like, you just spent all that money and all that time. And so I, I'm, I'm not, you know, usually a, a big fan of, you know, when it comes to, you know, whether it's electronics or whatever, like, Oh, I just go out and buy a new one. And you're, you're good to go with this, with it being a living thing and a, and a, um, a breathing ecosystem. Like you've got to kind of reintroduce what you know is good and what you know will work. Yeah. Um, so when we were talking about that bef- before the stream a bit, uh, which was what happened to my neighbor's yard too, because I was really planning on thinking that I just needed to overseed some newer cultivars in there, make it blend better in terms of the overall color and things. But then he wants to do some grading work, and some of it's pretty extensive because there's some washout areas in his yard. And then I was telling him that I was like, well, if we're going to have to sp- fully seed those areas and then try to blend it with other areas that are existing and i mean the turf that's there is some of the older stuff you know some of the older varieties it's like you're going to want it's going to look weird and then you're also going to look at this new stuff and say oh i want it all to look like that so we might as well just make it all look like that at the beginning or try to at least yeah and and i think that's the thing that if if you're listening or watching this to take in vain that like Ryan and I both have some pretty high expectations when it comes to stuff. Your expectations might be different and you might be accepting of, Hey, you know what? If the textures are different and we've got some, you know, again, stocky ryegrass or clumpy fescue, like that's fine for me. Don't feel compelled that you have to, that this is the only way out, the only exit off the freeway towards, you know, good grass. Like that's not the case. Um, you can do some good work and, and build that up. And let's just say, you know, on a one to 10 scale, like you feel like your lawn's at a five, I might say, rip the bandit off. You might say, Hey, you know what? I'm willing to put some time in here over the next two or so years and bump it up to a seven. And you know what? I can live with that. And yep. there is no wrong answer there. There absolutely yeah, everyone, is. Yeah. Everyone in our neighborhood was, you know, in the last few years since I've started helping him work on that was just like, Oh, this lawn is, looks great. And he was He's happy with it too, but he is getting to the point where I am of, I want it better than just average. Like I want it to look like what yours looks like across the street. And I'm like, well, yeah. And that's, and and I'm telling you, I see that, you know, a ton with, you know, folks I know and uh, consulting clients alike where, you know, your situation is you are at that five, right? And then you bump it up, you know, through whatever means, you know, through overseeding or through just, you know, uh, optimizing your fertility and watering and all these other things. And you get to a seven, you're like, man, this is great. But now I'm nitpicking like littler details, you know, smaller granular details. And it's like, I just got to do this. And so I see that all the time where um, just taking that leap from, again, just arbitrary numbers, but from that five to that seven, you're... um, your level of expectations jump and the level of detail that you see jumps even further. And so, yeah. you know, that's, that's a fun journey to go on. That's why we do this, right. Is we, we like to take care of stuff and make it better. Even if it is, you know, a five to start or a 9.9 to start, there's always a way to make it better. And I think it's important to understand for some people too, that you can only get so far on certain grasses. Like if the cultivar is what it is, and you're asking me every day, well, I put all this iron on it and I did all this stuff, but it's not getting any darker. It's not as green as I want it to be. Well, 
there's a reason why some of the more high-end expensive varieties and the color and all of that cost what they do is because that's the best of the best and you can't turn you can't turn that necessarily old plant into that new one and make it look exactly the same no and you know regardless of of age you know just in terms of of, of cultivars and things like that just the technology and the genetics you know if i take a ford taurus out to the drag strip i am not going to expect to run like 11 12 13 seconds like it's just not going to happen I might be okay with that. I might be fine with, you know, rolling out there in my white New Balance dad shoes and my Taurus and burning down the strip. But <laughs> if I really want to, you know, impress some people and show them what I got, I'm going to have to step up and I'm going to have to have, you know, a modded out Mustang. And it's going to, you know, we're going to have to optimize that to make sure, you know, fuel injection system, all that, you know, all this stuff is like on point to be you're able showing to your You're showing your overall car knowledge here, Ryan. This is awesome. Oh, well, I don't know. But anyway, I'm just saying you got I, I like I like analogies and I like being able to bring it to bring it down to a level that most people can understand. And, you know, if I put a um, if I put a Ford Taurus and a Ford Mustang out in front of you and I'm going to say, hey, I need you to win a, a really, really important race, you know, in some tough and challenging conditions. I know what people are going to generally pick. Now, when I tell you that, hey. You're probably going to have to spend like four times the amount of energy and effort and money and whatever to take care of, you know, the Mustang versus the, the Taurus, then people might make a different decision. So that's what it comes down to is setting that level of expectation of, um, you know, how good you want to be and um, what you need to do to, to get to that point. And that's really what it comes down to making that decision. So. You know, there's there's nothing wrong with being a Taurus guy. There's nothing wrong with being a Mustang guy, um, and rolling with it. Yep. You know, be who you are. So, in terms of when these things should begin, we were talking a bit about that, but I think we should touch on if you are wanting to do full renovations or if you decide to just try to do some overseeding into your yard. Now, obviously, we're we're talking to an audience here that has a, a wide variety of location, but in terms of a general sense of how far you need to start before you know winter time and all that what what would be your recommendation yeah you're going to see a wide variety of recommendations i mean uh the the thing i would say is a, a good predictor more uh, more or less is you can go look up your frost free date um pretty much anywhere on the or, or not frost free that's in the springtime i should say first frost date for the fall is that you can look up on the internet so I would like to have um, a minimum of four weeks before we get to that point, and that's really pushing it. But ideally, you know, we in most years here, like again in Ohio, uh, our fr first frost here in central Ohio is usually about uh, I want to say um, the first week of October. Um, yeah, so you know that puts us if we're at four weeks, that puts us you know right around Labor Day, you know maybe a few days after. Uh, depending on the calendar that year, but in general terms, you know, that's kind of like, hey, I got to have this stuff in. Now, um, with the weather being what it is, you know, here we can usually go um, two or three weeks before that, you know, so anytime from say like the 10th of August all the way up until the end of the month and, and in through Labor Day is sort of the go zone for a renovation situation. Um, on the if you're going to do overseeding, you can be closer to the back end of that and try to get stuff up and growing. Um, there's some things and some techniques that we'll talk about with an overseeding situation that you might use that might be better to use when temperatures are sort of you know kind of on the downside a little bit. Um, and so trying to take advantage of those things too. But generally speaking, that's your window. Um, it, earlier the better if you've got irrigation, um, whether again that's you know just moving a hose around, you're committed to it, or if you've got an automatic system that you can adjust uh, for sure, trying to take advantage of warm soil temperatures, um, you know high sunlight um, through the day and, and that sort of thing. Those are really, really important. Are factors. there any restrictions then on temperature as far as if you decide to plant August 10th, let's say, and we're having the kind of year we're having right now where kind of extreme heat is happening? Um, is there anything there that you, obviously you have to have the water source, but I mean, if you do have the water source, is there any restriction that you should be watching for? You know, the, the biggest threat I would say, you know, heat and seed are, you know, th that's okay, you know, to get seed up as long as you can keep it moist and get it up. 
um, the thing I'd be most worried about and concerned with is we get it up and we have a moist environment and let's say it's staying warm. It's still in the 90s and we're still close to 70 at night. The first thing we're looking for is damping off, which is a disease very similar to Pythium. So um, some things you can do to combat that, you know, there are some um, granular fungicides you can put down. Spraying over top of new seedlings isn't ideal, so there's some things you can put down at seeding. And there's also coated seed uh, as well. So it's a big thing in agriculture for a long time, and you're seeing it really kind of jump over to the turf side here in the last three, four, five years um, where they will coat that seed with uh, the actual fungicide that um, most folks use to knock down pythium and damping off. So it uh, kind of gives you that protection in that, like, you know, 14 days or so out of seeding um, against some of that stuff, and it can really help you out and get through a tough period. But um, if you're going to go early, at, you know, looking at something like that, looking at a coated seed is definitely worth your time. I've had some pretty good luck with going earlier, being wetter at a hotter time, and having better luck with the coated versus the non-coated. Mm-hmm. Totally different. I've had, some, I've had some good luck with seeding, especially last year, that bluegrass that I did. Mm-hmm. It was probably around 90 when I, you know, for that week. And as long as I had the water there, uh, it worked amazingly well because of how the it germinated, you know, six or seven days and I was getting good rates there. Exactly. And I, I've seen the same thing too, is that, you know, you can get it up quicker and that's that's a really important thing, um, you know, trying to t- take advantage of that window, trying to take advantage of that, you know, four to seven week sprint that you have before you get that first frost. And that's not like a, a killer, like it's not going to just, you know, completely turn on a dime how it's going to respond. But that's sort of like the next chapter. And, OK, how do we take care of it before we really yeah. harden off for winter? And I have seen the issue with some of that damping off to um, happen to me. I mean. Sometimes in the fall, you'll get a weird thing that happens a couple of days of like really high temperatures too and humidity that comes back and it just happens sometimes. Yeah. But and, and, you know, the, the biggest thing there for, from a planning sense is just buy enough seed that you have a little bit of extra if you need to throw it out there. Um, not uncommon. It's not, you're not a, a failure if you, if only 70% of your seed comes up or whatever, like you know, just realize that that's part of the game and that's what you're going to have to do. So, Or your seed washes out three times like happens to me every single time I do renovation. Hey, netless blanket. Best stuff I've ever made. Yep. So, so in terms of the prep work, let's move a bit to that side of things. Um, uh-huh. what, what should you be doing before the renovation? Is there anything, you know, looking at your soil and maybe figuring out what could be added as far as before you even get your seed down? Yeah, so for sure. I think this season, critical to understanding if there's any deficiencies that need to be corrected, and now is the time to start um, working through that. So I think you had a pretty good um, soil test video from this past spring that came out. Um, I think that's a good primer on exactly what you need to do. Um, The most uh, important thing I would say when it comes to testing is your collection, right? So making sure that you're um, collecting at a consistent depth uh, across your entire lawn. So, um, you know, just real quick is phosphorus is like our most important element when it comes to seed development, right? And so, um, been some really, really good work out of University of Wisconsin and um, University of Nebraska about, you know, you go down zero to one inches and then you go down one to two, three to four, four to five, and the difference in P across those different um, ranges goes down like almost 75%. So if I sample everything, you know, or or I have a mixed bag of, well, here's some two inch stuff and here's some four inch stuff, I'm not gonna get a real true reading of what I've got in the soil. So that could be a critical critical point of failure, so. So what should they be looking for in terms of that core then? Let's say they just grab a six inch core. So six inch. What do you, what do you wanna take as far as the soil to get a good accurate reading? Six is fine. Um, It's just how you report it to the lab because the lab is going to make their base their calculations off uh, what you tell them that you did. So if you do six inch, make sure you do six inch, and that's what they're going to assume um, most times. And it's good to check with the lab because sometimes they'll take ag samples as six, and they'll take turf samples and assume that they're four. Um, others will just do six across the board. So um, it, wh- whatever lab you're going to use, usually there, most of the websites I know Waypoint um, Spectrum is who I use here in Ohio, Spectrum Analytical. Um, 
they're really good about kind of uh, putting all that information out there up front so that you know what you need to do. So check the literature, make sure that you know what depth you're, you're supposed to sample at. And if you make a mistake, just note that on the form and they can correct that when they calculate all your stuff. So on that actual core then try to, so basically we're just going through a, a little bit of this here, but sure. remove that sort of thatchy stuff yep. at, up at the top. Mm -hmm. And then do you want to take all of that soil underneath all the way to the six inch mark or do you want to take a specific part of it? No, I want to take the whole thing. Okay. I want the whole thing. So that way we get um, an accurate measure through our entire profile because any of the recommendations are going to be based on, they basically take that whole core, dry it down in an oven, grind it all up and then that's what they sample. So mm -hmm. um, that's what they'll be looking for. I think the difficult thing when I've done soil testing too has just been a lot of our soil here does really well at growing deeper roots and then it's like well I have roots all through this whole thing I can't really figure out how to get rid of them all that well but you just kind of got to sift through it and do your best. Yeah and you just might need to take more samples then so you can get more more soil out of there but that's a good problem to have though is you know healthy root mass and having to knock it off as compared to you know, there's no roots at all, and you're wondering, you know, why. Well, at that point, there's probably a reason that you're renovating. So, yeah, yeah. So, so if you have been fertilizing this year, I know that's a question a lot of people have too. Is that going to throw off any of your results? Should you decide to do your test right now before the renovation? You know, it's it's it is going to throw it off to a certain extent, um, and some labs will will. Uh, ask you if you fertilized in the last say 30 days uh, to try and help um, offset that a little bit when they do their calculations but um, you can you can calculate what you've put down right so I can calculate and put out um, say I've put out you know um, a pound of um, phosphorus or p2o5 per thousand over the course of this growing season thus far and two pounds of uh, potassium in the form of K2O, you can calculate your parts per million and have a pretty good idea of um, what you've put out there and how that's affected um, your soil test numbers. So don't be afraid to sample, just make sure you have good records of what you put down and you can kind of figure out what that deficit might be, if there is one, or surplus. Okay. And obviously, too, just getting your pH reading is going to be really key in that soil test as well, which helps on figuring out everything else. Yeah, yeah, that and CEC, just to understand again, what your soil is like without doing um, a full on um, physical analysis to understand sand cell clay, but those two numbers will tell you, um, one, what kind of adjustments you need to make, if any, to pH, and then on CEC, if you're on the lower side, that's gonna increase the frequency with which you need to fertilize. Uh, during your growing and beyond. So. Mm -hmm. so here's another question I get a lot is if you're, let's say you're changing your grade a bit or you're bringing in some foreign material soil wise to your yard, then how does that play into the soil test or figuring out like, should you be testing that material? Should you just wait until next spring and try to get a sense of what changed or how, how far down the wormhole do you want to go? Um, exactly. Yeah, so, you know, here's, here's what I envision most of the folks that are watching this would do. You know, you've got a low spot, you know, again, where a tree stump used to be, or the, your builder didn't do a great job grading the back corner of the lot, something like that. Like, those are pretty common situations where we're just going to bring in and add soil. Um, it, I would I would not be so much worried about what you're getting. I would inspect what you're going to get before you get it. I wouldn't just, you know, pull up the internet and say, you know, topsoil Des Moines, Iowa, and just take what they give me. Um, so sourcing that stuff and asking. I mean, it's legitimate to ask, hey, can I see, you know, a soil test for what you guys have done? Most of these folks are, are providing uh, soil to different entities, construction-related and otherwise, that they have to be able to furnish those specs. So... You know, you might get some pushback, and I know you and I have had this conversation about sand suppliers, and some people get a little ornery and whatnot, but you know what? You're the customer, and they should be able to provide you with information to back up their product. So um, if you want to get down to that level of detail, then yeah, I think it's fair to ask for that. And when it's being combined with a soil that's already there, uh, again, if the soil test checks out, I wouldn't be too worried about it. Trying to get those completely even, the only way you're going to do that is physically... Um, 
basically blend them together on site. So there's different machines that we use, um, like in sports turf, for example, um, you know, um, let's say the twins redid their field. They'd take out like the top four inches of existing material. They put four inches of new in. So they would do two, they would till that into the bottom six inches of existing. And then they put two more and they would till that up and do it several times over to try and homogenize all those soils together and try to have as good of a mix as is reasonably possible without them removing everything and putting it through a big pug mill mixer and then trucking it all back in. That's just not practical. Um, and so what I just said right there is probably not practical for a home lawn. Now there's things that you can do. If somebody's really, really interested, throw a comment in here. And, uh, there's a couple attachments that you can get for like a, a, a skid steer track loader or like the little like Toro dingoes that can help uh, do some of that. If you have some layering or you have some funky soils that you want to, um, amend with some different things, then there's different ways to do that. That's a whole nother yep. topic. So, yep. Okay, well, I think that pretty much covers as far as the soil testing stuff goes, but now we get to seed choice and cultivars, and this is a huge deep dive, so I don't think we're going to go too crazy here. We'll be here for the next three hours. Yeah, I mean, can't we just go to Home Depot and buy whatever, you know, is on the shelf? I thought that's what you do, Ryan. Ryan. Yeah, I know. Yeah. I know. Yeah. (laughs) So please don't do that. If you, I mean, you can do that if you want to, but um, if you're here... You probably don't want to do that, but go on, Ryan. I'm sorry. Yeah, I was just going to say, I think the biggest part that has changed my yard when people ask me, how did you get it to look a certain way, or especially after I decided to real mow, I had to look at the the actual seed there and say, what is capable of being cut at under an inch and, and specific things there. Now, that's not going to be for everybody in a home yard. I get that, but... What kinds of things can you look at to choose some seed? And yeah, like you said, you can go to Home Depot, you can get seed from a store, but don't expect the results of the the extreme high end seed. It's not going to be exactly the same stuff. Yeah, so you know, there's a couple. Uh, here's my my thing. We'll kind of go through this step by step. Um, first thing to understand is you know those cultivars. So now we're getting into Again, the Taurus versus the Mustang debate, and what do I want to have? And there's nothing wrong with either one. Again, so you're and you're going to pay for that Mustang. You're going to pay for that performance, and that's what you were looking for was a very specific level of performance. So then, um, how do you evaluate an individual car's, or in this case, a cultivar's performance? So if you're not familiar with it, there's a um, organization called the National Turfgrass Evaluation Program, NTEP. So ntep.org, um, and you can Google that and find information that they have on specific cultivars um, year over year and testing data from multiple sites uh, throughout the country and kind of get a sense of how those grasses perform, whether it be for spring green up or disease resistance or drought tolerance and different key characteristics um, for those. So that's a whole deep dive topic to get into, but the one thing I'll say is they kind of give them to you in tables, right, where they're ranked. And if you um, aced statistics in college, like I did, like the only one math class I actually did decent in, but there's a a column on the very far right side called um, LSD, least significant difference. And so if you look at those columns and you can learn and understand what those numbers mean, um, what you find is that those rankings that you see there, like one through whatever, 30, depending on how many cultivars they have in there, it's not like the college football rankings per se. Like it's not the, the 20, number 25 is that much worse than number one. So when you go read those charts, don't look at it as the left-hand column of the rankings, but look at those uh, orders of significant difference to understand how much different one grass might be from the other. So pretty deep dive there, but but ntep.org, please check that out to kind of get started. Um, and I think there's another one that's, that might be for some people, too, when we were talking about that water thing, is there's some water conservation testing being done on some of these, too. I can't remember what that's called. There's a certain organization, too. But um, So some of these higher-end ones now, too, they're looking at how well do they do in drought and, and stuff specifically, because I know water conservation across the country is going to probably be a big thing going forward, as it always is. But Yeah, so I, I don't know about how much on cool season. I know they did some tall fescue recently, but 
uh, University of California at Riverside is doing a ton of work uh, on drought stress, drought tolerance, um, and all that kind of stuff. And so maybe another good resource to look at. Um, beyond that, like if you're looking at really high end stuff, um, you know, another good resource to uh, two other things real quick would be one call the seed company, you know, and they should be able to give you some good resources, at least of, you know, the questions I'd ask there are, Hey, who do you know in my area that's growing this, you know, and they should be able to, if they don't know, they can reach out to their supplier and find out. But that's another good way to get connected with, uh, for instance, like you, like um, D and K Turf there in town sells a couple of really high end varieties. They might be able to tell you, oh yeah, if you go over here to you know such and such high school or you know college, whatever they might have it. So that's a good resource to have. And then the sod growers themselves too is if you pick up the phone and say, hey, I'm thinking of growing um, whatever um, type of bluegrass in my yard. What do you think about this? Most of those guys will talk to you and give you a little bit of time and kind of give you their mm-hmm. insight and back story on it. So, and those NTEP readings too. When you look at that, they have various sites across the country, which helps yeah. to give you an idea of maybe what the tests look like in your area compared to other regions. Because things vary so much that you can't say necessarily it, that one is better than another if you're in the mountains or you're in the East Coast or yeah. Absolutely, yeah. It's it's you you find the site that's closest to you and kind of get a sense of that, but. Don't be afraid to look at other sites too, and maybe kind of also see if you're seeing similar results, you know, year over year. Mm-hmm. And the last thing I'll say about NTEP too is that every seed company has a way to spin those rankings to make them look very good in marketing. So my advice is, if you're going to go down that that path, is make sure that you look at the information, the statistics yourself, and make your own determination. So yeah, and the other difficult thing about those testing. Uh, that site sometimes that when I've looked at it is just a lot of things are under a code type of name too because they're not wanting to put out like their brand name yet or whatever so so, yeah usually those are like unreleased varieties yet that they're just in testing so they're giving to NTEP uh, as experimental varieties and making selections so um, yeah the grass breeding process and what it takes to get a cultivar to market is pretty crazy I mean that's a good topic in and of itself to go down that road but um in a future episode but for sure it's um it's one way to do it so you know if you want to go on the data and the hard uh, facts side that's one way to do it the other way is the human side anecdotal talk to people that are actually growing it and try to get a sense of what they're seeing um and go from there so you know the other thing that you're going to find too and I, i can't remember i know you said you had a mono stand but you do have um a couple areas, right, that are more than one cultivar, correct? Yeah, the ryegrass area that I have in the front is, I mean, I've I've overseeded it a couple times now, too, so there's probably six different varieties in there, and then the one I did my full renovation of a mixture of blue and ryegrass, there were three varieties of each of those that were put in. Oh, wow, okay. So then that's that gets back to um, making sure that um, you know, our listeners slash viewers understand the difference between what a mixture and a blend is. So, uh, a mixture, we've got more than one species that's in that seed mixture, right? And a blend would be like what your ryegrass is, which is a blend of multiple, more than two cultivars or more than one cultivar, uh, excuse me, in, uh, that bag. So, you know, typical, you know, a lot of the, the common ones that you're going to see, um, you know, bluegrass blends, so multiple multiple bluegrass cultivars in one bag, um, as 100% uh, Kentucky bluegrass, pretty common to see a three or four cultivar um, product that's put out there. Um, other ones that are popular, um, varying percentages, but somewhere between like 80-20 and 90-10 bluegrass to ryegrass, that's a pretty popular one. Um, 80-20 tall fescue um, to rye or blue, depending on the part of the country that you're in. And then another one that's that's become pretty popular kind of all around, it's a really really good all-around seed mix, is an 80-10-10. So 80% uh, turf-type tall fescue, 10% rye, 10% blue. And so, you know, the, the thing that I always caution folks to is, you know, when you're looking at these things, um, the pricing is going to be very, very different when you start looking at things. So like that, 
high-end um, three- or four-way blend of bluegrass might be um, at a retailer that you can find locally, somewhere between three fifty and 5 bucks a pound online. I, you know, I don't know what the online market's like. I see the, some of the prices that folks post from some of the online retailers, and it's crazy how much people are paying to get it shipped to them. But yeah, yeah. I, I know that uh, you, know, you look at that versus, say, like an 80-10-10, you're going to find that at a retail location um, for good seed, somewhere between like a buck seventy-five and two twenty-five a pound, something like that here in the Midwest. So you look at that and you're like, oh my gosh, it's twice as much for bluegrass. Well, then look at the seeding rates, and that's really important too. So um, that's your true cost is what does it take me to seed per thousand square feet or per acre? Um, use that as a comparison, not per pound pricing. Yeah, because that bluegrass seed is tiny, and you don't need you don't need much of it to it goes a long way. Yeah, two million seeds so. per pound is will go a long way, a lot longer than four hundred thousand seeds per pound. Yeah, so yeah. And something I I mean we can talk about quickly here too is a lot of times when people go to the store and let's just say it's a big box store they they want to look at the tag. Well, the thing also I pay attention to would be weed seed in there or other crop that's in there because you could go through all this work and you're actually adding some sort of thing you really don't want in your yard at all by using a certain seed. So, Yeah, I mean, that, that's the other thing too is that other crop and weed seed, you know, and it might even be a negligible percent, but especially when you're in um, higher seed count products like Kentucky Bluegrass, if I see something in there while well, there's 2 million seeds per pound, that 0.01% equals, you know, a considerable amount that I don't want to have out there. I don't want to see, you know, um, 200 uh, Poa trivialis plants in my new, no. newly planted lawn. So it's, you know, that's the other thing too. I mean, there, there's a lot of things that can go into seed selection, um, where it's coming from. So, you know, older fields that are in Oregon and Washington, those are kind of the, the blue bloods as far as um, grass seed growers but they've also got a lot of issues and contamination. Not always, not always. You're going to see that reported on the sticker, but what I mean is there's a lot more Poa Triv and Poa Anya and things like that out on those farms that just take that, you know, with a grain of salt and make sure that you're looking at that, like you said, the weed and other crop for sure. Um, and there's other locations too that they're starting to grow stuff in to mitigate that. Um, but by no means are they bad, you know, coming from those from those areas at all. It's just you got to make sure that you're looking at the right things on the seed tag. Yeah. I think there's some up in northern Minnesota now where they're growing some different seed. Uh, ryegrass, I know I've seen a couple times on some labels. Tall fescue as well, and part of the reason they're doing that, there's like very, very little poa up there because of the winter. Like it just can't hang in the wintertime in the fields that they're planting in. So I know of a couple uh, seed companies that are up there now. Short growing season obviously, but um, they're able to turn crop around pretty quick and there's not a lot of competition for land. Um, I need to go on a little uh, little visit up there, I think. Yeah, you can wear that Vikings hat proudly up there too. They won't, they won't uh, curse you. Everyone, everyone will be like, this is normal, so that's good. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, what else? How about, how about leveling? Because this uh, is a topic. But let, let's just briefly say when we were talking about the leveling stuff, um, you know, soil, sand. I do have a very extensive video this year that Ryan actually helped me gather a lot of the information on as far as sand and what, what it sort of requires, what types to look at, all that. So I do have a video on that if you want a deep dive on sand specifically and leveling. But how about a little talk on, on that as far as if you need to fix a grade or you need to, you want a real mow and you're, what are some of the things that people can do here before renovation? I mean, there's, there's so much variability to this topic that it gets, you know, very, very, um, project specific, but if we're going to kind of distill it down and make it easy to, easy to take away, um, if we've got, um, let's say, you know, an area where a tree used to be planted, cut down, and now it's sinking or something like that. Like we, those situations we talked about previously, back corner of the lot wasn't graded very well. Adding those things in uh, with just regular soil and leveling those areas, perfectly fine. Um, and even if we've got areas where, you know, water runs or water delays, we need to make sure that we understand that if we're going to put soil in there, we're displacing that, where's that water going to go? So these are the type of things where, 
the planning is so important because let's say that we do plant, um, you know, whatever it is, bluegrass, tall fast, you don't care what, what kind of grass you plant, but we've got water laying in a spot in the yard. Well, a day like today, like we were just talking about earlier, you know, 70 degree dew points, like that area is going to be prime for something bad to happen, you know? And so these are the things that, you know, you remove those layers of um, ways that the yard itself or even spots in it can fail. So yeah, lifting, lifting those up with soil um, and making sure they're on grade, no problem. Just make sure you know where the water's going. Sand, um, uh, sand in, in lawns, I look at, you know, you have, there's two different applications that I would specifically use it. One is if you're on existing turf, you're not going to renovate and you want to level your lawn. It's the easiest way to do it um, and safest way to do it as opposed to like trying to spread topsoil and not smother and kill your grass, right? Um, so there's that avenue of it. The other avenue is like doing a true sand cap, which I think you and uh, Connor Ward, uh, I know you showed me that picture. I don't know if that made it on YouTube or not, but that dude's got... Connor said I can't show him, I can't show that to anyone. That's what he said. Wow, well, okay, well, I just, I just outed you. So if you're watching Connor, I'm sorry, but it is a tremendously awesome sand cap. So that, that gets back into, you know, if you're going to be real mowing and if you need to be... Um, super level across, you know, your entire lawn, that's the way to do that. You know, soil is always going to have kind of that, and especially here in the Midwest with freeze thaw cycles and having to mow when it's wet, you know, and you know, you have to mow, but it's, and it's too wet, but you got to mow like all that kind of stuff creates that unevenness that makes it really, really difficult to, to stay on grade and to have uh, a clean quality of cut, especially at low heights. But, you know, I'd say if you're plus one and a half, two inches, like you can be fine with soil and you'll be all right. Like there's no reason sand would be more for low cut and, and that sort of thing. So, um, yep. so soil. And then sourcing, sourcing that material too is very important because like we talked about getting something decent, whatever you're using soil or sand, and then the right types of sand, which we go into in that video that I've talked about this spring with sand leveling is important going forward so you know it's not just kind of a set it and forget it one time deal uh, with the whole sand leveling deal yeah and same thing with soil too is don't be afraid you know like i said to ask for those those uh, um, facts and figures about it what they have on it as far as testing goes and don't be afraid to ask for a sample and if it shows up and you know before they dump it i'm always a stickler for let me look in the truck real quick let me take a peek um you know, if you see, you know, parts of brick or like broken glass or, you know, a used band-aid, like there's been all sorts of nasty stuff that ends up where a lot of those folks don't have like one place they get it from. They're moving around like different soil sites and things like that. So it could change and you want to make sure that you're getting what you pay for. I'm one of those crazy people that actually sift it after it's been sent to my house and do it uh -oh, wheelbarrow man. full. No, I mean, that's like, I don't know. That's like take and bake pizza. Like I never got the whole like take and I don't bake. Get like, it either. I'm gonna make the whole damn thing at my house or I'm going to like go out and get pizza from somewhere or have it delivered to me. I don't want to go in between. So same thing with soil. I'm either gonna take and use what I got on my property, or by gosh, you know, they're gonna bring it to me ready to go and I'm gonna use that stuff. So I'm, I'm no just take and bake soil, Brian. No take and bake. Glutton for punishment. I guess. Glutton for punishment. Jeez. That's how I am. That sounds like prison work. <laughs> yeah, but hey, I will say after that stuff is sifted, it is beautiful for putting down on my low cut turf. Well, but. That, that'll be good. We'll we'll put a soil processor on your Christmas list for 2021. I would love that. <laughs> <laughs> so, are there any tools? Kind of, I guess that w I would say. Um, also, one other thing on the sand part that we were talking about is seeding into the sand can be a bit more difficult with moisture and Ooh, yeah. different things too. So that's one other thing to pay attention to. Definitely. Definitely. Um, yeah, it just changes everything. And so, you know, if you do go the sand route, um, everything that you read about grow ins and renovation, if you're Googling stuff or watching stuff on YouTube or whatever, like it's probably not a hundred percent applicable to you. Uh, cause that's a different situation growing in little bit more degree higher degree of difficulty um, because of the watering you know the frequency and timing of that and also of fertilizer applications and things like that so 
just to keep that in mind that if you do go that route, it's going to be a little bit different um, in how you take care Especially of it. Especially... If it's ninety five degrees outside uh, and you've got you got sand like yeah really getting hot. Well, and that's the thing with you know just real quick you know sand heats up a lot quicker you know the specific heat of it is um, a lot higher so where it goes and, and gets hotter quicker and, and cools off quicker. Whereas soil it takes a little bit longer for it to get warm, um, but it holds heat uh, a lot better. So take that for what it is, but it's it's definitely something where um, you got to be on your game if you're on sand. Yeah. So I think my last thing here on just the preparing would just be look at the tools that you need. Yeah. Um, think about that at least ahead of time. So you're not sitting there without anything, without any tools whatsoever to do your reno. Like I'm, you're going to need uh, some basic stuff. Well, and I'm going to rely a little bit more on you cause I'm, I'm a, I'm a big boy toy guy when it comes to renovation. You know, we're using uh, track loaders and dozers and all kinds of big stuff. So you know, I could see where like a level on and, you know, some hard rakes and some things like that on a smaller scale. But, you know, what you tell me, what what do you typically see or what what has been um, your best and most productive tool and what has been the tool that you thought you were going to need and you were like, this thing's a piece of garbage. I don't even know why I have it. Yeah, uh, I'd say definitely that level on tool that I have is pretty amazing in terms of if you're going to be moving soil or sand around and trying to grade anything by hand, it's pretty, it's pretty awesome. And then some of the simple things, even just like a regular little plastic rake, like I found that to be so handy when you, a couple times it's happened to me where I put down soil and then it's rained and the soil gets kind of that crusty nature to it. And there might be a few rocks that sort of come to the surface or little pebbles or something. You can easily clean all that stuff off with just one of those simple plastic rakes. Um, but then really in terms of, you know, you've got to have a spreader or some kind of thing to put down the seed. And depending on what you want to do as far as weed, or fertilizer with it or something like tenacity you know you could think about some sprayers too but i think for in general i don't know if there's anything that i use that i just absolutely have been like this is a piece of junk but well that's good that's good i mean the <laughs> basics are basic for a reason right like they're tried and true and you know it's just sometimes not even so much the tools uh as much as the techniques right so those are things too that uh I'm sure that we can talk about as, as we get closer to that time, but, you know, that, having that set of basic tools, um, you know, shovels, rakes, all that kind of stuff, but that level on, you know, especially if you're moving any type of soil, and it's got to be dry, like it's not going to move clumpy yep. or clotted up stuff, like it's got to be good and dry, so um, if you're thinking about using something like that, it might be worth getting, um, like, the screened uh, processed topsoil that's real loose and friable, so. Yep screened and then sifted sifted right, right. okay <laughs> and then we count how many rocks are in it too while we're at it right yeah <laughs> so let's go to how that process works if you're going to spray out your yard what kinds of products can you use there's a swear word that i can't say on youtube anymore uh, or i really can't show it unless i want to get blasted down by a bunch of people but that that word would be glyphosate so well okay so here's the thing um glyphosate is a it's a tool you know and there's many other tools that are out there too um so let's just talk about chemical non-chemical right it's not the only one out there it's you know um i'm not going to sit here and debate whether it's you know wh what it is and where it fits in in, in uh society but i will say that it's effective you know from a cost standpoint it's effective and safe if used properly and used um per the label instructions and so really beyond that um you know if i was going to use that my process would be um you know to keep it you know straight to the point three and three three apps seven days apart, 3% solution. So 3% solution on that is uh, just a little uh, over four ounces per gallon. And like I said, the, the entire point of that is I wanna make sure that everything is completely, um, has a complete kill on it. And it also gives me the opportunity to, um, there's a, on the label, there's a seven day restriction for seeding. So if I sprayed last Saturday, I couldn't seed until this coming Sunday, right? Um, 
And actually, they did some really cool work out of Kansas State several years ago where they tried different regimes of spraying all the way up to the day of seeding and actually even three days past that. So this is, again, where planning comes in of you want to what we call follow, you know, F-A-L-L-O, follow the, the yard to let all the vegetation that's there get killed out. Um, and I would do this no matter what kind of chemical regime you're using. Now, glyphosate is nice because it's a systemic product. It's going to go all the way through the xylem of the plant, get all the way down to the roots, all that kind of stuff. And that's what that goes for weeds, desirable and undesirable grasses that you have in there. Um, the other product that is, is available um, and labeled for turf is uh, the active ingredient is glufosinate ammonium. So it's marketed under the labels of uh, Finale and also Cheetah Pro. Uh, the difference there is it is a contact herbicide, so meaning what it touches it kills. It does not move in the plant very little. It moves a little tiny bit, but you're not going to get that same level of root kill. So the idea is that you know you stunt it and um, knock it back with one application. You can do three. I think three might be overkill on glufosinate and ammonium because by that after that second application, like there's no tissue that's going to take up any more uh, herbicide. So um, it's a little bit in terms of the actual product safety. Uh, to the applicator and to the environment, it's actually more dangerous. Um, so our next option is not as safe, which is kind of weird, but that's where we are with chemical control. So that leads you into, what if I don't want to use any of that? What if I'm nervous? What if, whatever, whatever your reason might be. So a non-chemical strategy for um, controlling all that stuff is actually going to be what we call solarization. So that's a simple process where we take um, plastic and we put it over the yard, we pin it down and we let the sun shine through this plastic. So what type of plastic I'm talking about here would be like um, the plastic uh, visqueen drop cloth like you would use for painting in your house. And so that one or you know one to four mil plastic is perfectly fine. So the sun shines through that, it literally bakes the soil. So you want to make sure that you have a lot of moisture in the soil before you put it down because that's what's going to allow it to heat up to a temperature above, say, like 110, 115, kill all the weed seeds, kill all um, the insects and whatever else is in there, and do it without chemicals. And so that process right there takes a good, uh, even in summer heat, you'd want to probably do that for at least three or four weeks. So that's a, a, a long process. So again, if you're thinking about timing, now is the time to get on that, for sure. So... So with what we're dealing with with the weather right now in terms of so much heat and a lot of dormancy going on, can you still, if you're going that chemical route, can you still use those products on there? What do you need to, to be looking for? So it's kind of like counterintuitive, right? You want to have healthy growing turf to push that stuff through. So if you can, um, you're going to water your, um, your dead man walking lawn to get it growing a little bit better. And then something else you can do too is add just a little bit of uh, fertilizer. So whether you throw a little bit of granular down uh, of nitrogen, again, you're not worried about burn because, well, you're going down that road. And the other thing is too, you can put it in your spray solution as well. So uh, just that little bit of kick of nitrogen will help um, invigorate some growth. It'll take some more um, energy away from the plant when it starts to die and then Obviously, it can help uh, the herbicide. If you do put it in your spray tank, it can help actually help the herbicide get into the plant. I've so. sprayed mine uh, on that first side renovation that I did. It was pretty dormant when I sprayed it because it was a really hot summer that year, too. And mm -hmm. then I started watering afterwards, you know, to try to get the weeds to come up or whatever, whatever I missed. And mm -hmm. then I sprayed again, and, and everything worked out fine there. Yeah, and again, again, that's why you do that three and three program because it just gives you a little bit wider window. Um, and with it only being, you know, really like a, um, you know, a twenty-eight day process, so you've got a little bit of time there, and you can even shorten that up, like we said, in, in doing that last step closer to the seeding date and be okay. So, but yeah, so this, if you if you're gonna go the other route and go the solarizing route, um, you know, now is the time to start doing that and. Be prepared to answer all the questions of uh, why you have a whole pile of plastic all over your yard. My neighbors actually did it next door to me a couple years ago, and I had 
I had seen it done in certain situations, like for research and stuff at different universities, like how they prepared different plots. I had never seen anybody do it in a home situation or a home loan situation. And I was shocked, like how effective it was. And, and still to this day, um, you know, it's, I think it's been two or three years and they planted just kind of a, a run of the mill, slightly above average tall fescue and there's no weeds out there. Like it's still pretty, pretty darn clean. So it was, uh, that was uh, all I needed to see. Yeah. Obviously I think in a bigger lawn situation, it's probably not going to be practical. I mean, right. And, yep. and I mean that that's where chemicals come into play, right? That's why we have, you know, fungicides and uh, herbicides and insecticides, all these different things. These are tools to make large area production, whether it be agriculture, horticulture, whatever, to make them more effective and efficient. That's, that's what they're there for. So, um, yeah, but that's a whole nother topic. Yeah. So, go on. Uh, okay. This is a question that I get a lot or that I see people say a lot. Let's say they have a bluegrass lawn and it's actually a decent bluegrass lawn already or some of the higher end stuff. And then they say, well, I want to add some more bluegrass to it this fall. Is there a way to do that successfully? Because obviously bluegrass can be very slow to establish. So that new seed has a hard time competing with the existing grass. Is there, is there a way to do that? So there's two ways to do it. And one is more successful, I think, in my experience than the other. I'll let you guess after I tell you both ways. Okay, so the first way, let's say we're going to do a fall uh, overseed on bluegrass, okay, um, into an existing stand of good bluegrass, and we've got um, a situation where bluegrass is growing well at that time, I'm sure, right? We've got, you know, ample, uh, ample growth and things are looking good. So in that case, I want to do a couple of things. First thing would be, one, uh, ha already have your soil test done, make sure that you're good to go there, that you're not missing anything, which you shouldn't if you have good, uh, well-growing turf. The second part would be um, using a PGR. So using, uh, specifically, I would use um, Trinex and Pac Ethyl, which is TNX, Primo, um, TPAC, any of, the, any of the ones that you would see like that that's a... Um, Trinax and pack ethyl is the active ingredient. And what I would do is um, turn that into a basically like a, a, a two app kind of thing where about two or three weeks before I was going to seed, I would go ahead and put that out and get myself under regulation. Yeah, so if we go, you know, uh, three weeks before, and then from there, what we're trying to do is get what's there under regulation, okay? And so our rate might be, and a typical bluegrass rate is like uh, upwards of 33 ounces to the acre, 0.75 fluid ounces per M. Um, if you're in a high stress situation, I might back that down to closer to like half a fluid ounce per thousand, just so you don't overstress what's there. Um, but if you can and you're well growing and, and you've got good weather coming up, absolutely go ahead and shut it down. You might have some discoloration, you might have... Um, some weird looking stuff, don't worry about that. That's going to grow out of it just fine. But the idea is, is that you shut that down and give yourself a competitive advantage. So now I've got that three week window that I'm riding out and following my growth and growing degree day pattern. And then I'm going to follow that right up at the day of seeding with one more app to completely keep it under regulation. I don't want to really do that at the same time. Um, I want to do one full cycle before I actually seed and I'm in my second cycle when I seed. So that's going to give you, especially if you do this like August leading into September and try to catch maybe that um, Labor Day time, again, not quite as um, beneficial as like the early start that we were talking about on bare ground seeding for bluegrass, but you're also not trying to stress out your existing too much, you know, to that point of shutting it down in the middle of August when it really does need to keep growing all that kind of stuff. So it's a little bit more of a balancing act there to do it like that. Seed into it, um, one thing you want to do, no matter what, is cut your rate down. So a typical bluegrass seeding rate, you're going to see um, typically on a high end, like three pounds per thousand, 130 pounds an acre. Um, you want to back that down to closer to like one and a half, maybe two uh, pounds per thousand square feet. So um, less is more in this case, because you're already in, in a competition situation and you don't want to even be uh, over-competing even more with seedlings trying to do that. So 
Um, some other things you can do there too, thinning out the grass a little bit, you know, so I know like you've got the swordman if you have uh, the capability of doing something like that. A thatching rake can help um, or a dethatcher in, in certain cases, it's a little bit less stressful time. So those are things too that, again, you're going to accept a little bit of pain there um, and all that with, with getting it done. So the last and the second way would be uh, doing a dormant seeding, right? So we're going out here in the Midwest sometime in anywhere from December up through, um, like say February, and there's you know those January thaws that people always talk about when the soil uh, is actually workable and we've got you know a period of weather that's either warm enough and or dry enough to do that. Um, we get out there and we seed that. Um, the real key there is making sure that you get uh, good seed to soil contact, so making sure it gets down in the soil. And that goes for uh, the fall time as well. One thing with bluegrass that people do is just spread it with a lawn spreader or a, a rotary spreader and don't do anything to it to get it down in the soil. So that's like probably one of the, um, the cardinal sins with bluegrass is it has to be down in the soil at least like an eighth of an inch to have a really good chance of getting it to come up. So I really like that February time and try to get out if we can um, at that time because it seems like you get a really good um, spring catch on that stuff coming up, beating the weather a little bit than when if you were to wait till you know March or April or do a traditional spring seeding, you get a three or four week jump on that where you've already got stuff germinating coming up and then you can push it when you get that weather in the spring as opposed to just trying to get it to come up. So same thing, uh, keeping your rates on the, a little bit on the lower side, maybe bumping up a little bit just because you might have some seed loss due to uh, weather conditions otherwise. So maybe two, two and a half pounds per thousand in that case. So, um, yeah, those are the two ways. I mean, I've, I've had success with both for sure, but what do you, what, which one would you pick if you had to have your druthers? You know, I, I've briefly tried the, a couple times the dormant thing and I didn't have as much success with it maybe, but I liked the. I think I like the idea of that growth regulator thing. I have done that before on my specifically on my ryegrass when I did an overseed last year. I got it kind of in regulation a little bit, and then ryegrass isn't tough anyway because it's so easy to get that seed up and going. But mm -hmm. it really helped on a few. I did some like bare patches that I was like, oh, this other stuff. If I don't, it will be really really tall really quickly if I don't try to slow it a bit. But yeah. No, and I think that's that's really the thing is like it's a much more delicate balancing act and it might even take like a time or two to really figure out and fine tune the timing of it and you could be wrong on the weather like we could have you know here we had like really really hot temperatures in September and October last year and you'd look like an idiot if you <laughs> if you did it then so um, yeah I, I'm a big fan of the dormant um, I, I think you do get um, if you do it right and you have the proper equipment to get it seeded in there the right way, it can be very, very effective. Um, and more so because you don't have that same level of competition, same level of um, growth that you're trying to compete against as well. So that makes it just a little bit more palatable in that case. So, yeah, that's that's where I'm at is... Either way is a good way, but I like the dorm a little bit better. And not to forget that bluegrass itself, I mean, you take care of it well, it's going to get very thick and spread and do all of that. So it's not it's not a grass you have to be too worried about anyway on, on it being thin unless it's in the wrong type of condition. All right. Well, you know what? I think we have about exhausted ourselves on this topic today, but... Yes. That was pretty fun to, to get into the renovation side. I... I always say mowing is my number one thing I love in lawn care, and two is is renovation. And, and those two things, I guess they kind of go hand in hand, but that you're sort of a, a masochist there. You know, you create your own problems and then mow your way into new problems that you and, have to. And grow every your way out of. every time that I do a renovation, there's at least one point in during it where I say. This was a dumb idea. I've gone way too far this time, Ryan. You are an idiot. And then at the end, I'm like, oh, I'm glad I did that. So that's how you know you're doing it right. That's yep. exactly how you know. So that's good to see that you have the uh, the humility to know that eh, I could probably do better the next time. But I have no choice now. I'm past the point of no return. So. Exactly. You got to keep going, and you got to find a way to fix it. Absolutely. 
Well, hey, it was awesome talk. Um, like I said, really looking forward to our next episode and kind of drilling down a little bit more on renovation and certainly open to whatever questions come in and uh, thoughts from the group. But uh, Yeah, I think yeah. For, the, for the next episode, we'll try to cover more in depth, maybe the actual steps of these renovation topics. You know, what do you actually do in what order? And then also talk about uh, maybe some questions that you guys have from this episode. So, For sure. Well, hey, it was great talking to you. Uh, I, I found out that the Browns-Vikings preseason game was canceled, so I'm bummed. I thought we could have a really good segment on that. But, we could have uh, had a live stream and, and watched the game at the same time. It's just going to have to be the Super Bowl. That's it now, Ryan. That's all we have to look forward to. So. Yep. <laughs> what about the right. – I don't think the Gophers play Ohio State this year. Maybe they do. Oh, I, I mean, that's a guaranteed dub right there. It's, so. a, it's a killing no matter what. <laughs> <laughs> No doubt. All right. Well, hey, ski you my row the boat, right? Yep. All right. Well, hey, it was good talking, and uh, we'll see you here uh, next week. Sounds good.